Welcome to the Petro Papers podcast, Say That 10 Times Fast. This is where you get your oil and gas intellectual stimulation by asking the technical questions. I'm Yoga Sri Pradhan, and with me here today, I have Mike Rainbolt, who's a senior consultant at Rainbow Consulting. With me here today, I'm going to talk about SPE 201600, which the paper description and the citation is covered in the description box. We're gonna cover the fracture wing growth study using synchronized surface pressure data from monitoring offsetting wells. I'm going to talk a little bit about Mike before we get into the podcast. Mike Greenbold is a senior consultant at Rainbolt Consulting. He's a distinguished lecturer for SPE for this 2021 to 2022 cycle. He also served as a senior technical advisor for Aver Controls and a senior completions engineering advisor for Apache and has held many technical roles in his industry experience. He's written numerous technical papers for SPE and he's a registered professional engineer in the state of Texas and Oklahoma. Mike Rainbow graduated with a bachelor's of science in civil engineering in 1978. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, before we get into the weeds of the paper, I wanted to know, I know you've done some recent work with ABRA, so I was curious to know from your perspective what ABRA does. Okay, just to make sure that everybody understands, I'm not an employee of ABRA's. I'm, I consult for them every now and then, and I was a former employee. Uh, ABRA controls offers uh, renting and recording data from precision pressure monitoring uh, sensors. All of their sensors uh, record their data to the cloud. They're all in synchroni synchronized with cloud timing, and they're working on means of uh, enhancing the visualization of the data they record. They can also record surface uh, uh, treating data from the frac band. Anything that the frac band is recording, uh, ABRA can display and, and uh, save along with the pressure sensor data. It's very, they're, they have greatly advanced their capabilities. Awesome. And before I ask the specific questions of the paper, I want to help reorient our viewers and listeners if you can walk through what 201600 talks about. Yes, uh, this, this project originally started out as a monitoring of pressures from offsetting wells for Chesapeake. The goal was they, pre they preloaded their wells pre frac and they wanted to see how the preloading was impacted, impacted uh, uh, FDI reactions in offsetting wells. When I looked at the, at the plats that they set up or, or, or the orientations of all the offsetting wells, I realized that that was a minute part of the data that they had. They could also track fracture wing growth uh, between wells as it was happening in real time. Something that I have not seen other operators do. And I tried to document as much of this as possible. I realize now that there's far, far more that I could add to that paper, but it would have been 70 or 80 pages in length. And I was advised that uh, readers would burn out before they got through all that many plots. And I agree. Well. When I was reading through the paper, I can assure you I was not burned out. Rather, I was, I had a lot more questions to ask you than the questions that I sent over to you in terms of, in terms of uh, this, this podcast. And now I wanted to get into the specifics where I've done a lot of work with FDI correlations with magnitude, the distance between primary and infill wells, and then looking at the resulting in fill well performance. From this paper, and even if you can talk about your experience, have you found that, that correlation between an FDI magnitude, the distance between primary infill well and resulting infill well performance? Absolutely. 
FDI magnitude is proportional to distance. There's no doubt about it. In fact, if you'll go back and look at uh, an, an SB paper that I co-authored co with you and Yvonne, you will discover in 194.349 that there was a vertical well that offset one of the treatment wells by 300 feet. And it uh, encountered a 3000 PSI FDI magnitude strike when we got close to it. In my paper, you can easily see that there's uh, first order and second order wells. And in every case, the first, the first order well has a, has a larger magnitude than the second order well. And it also takes longer for that. For that. If you look at my SB for 189.853, I, I also document in that paper, I'm sorry, 187192 in a, a, a Woodford well that well was 1,600 feet away from the primary, from the treatment well. It, the, the FDI magnitudes were low, but they had a massive impact on the, on the treatment, on the uh, primary well, as the primary well was attempted to be brought online. Uh, there's no question about it. If you're looking at FDI magnitudes, you must consider distance. And since distance is important, you must not prejudge that magnitude automatically is proportional to the effect on the well. I demonstrated this in the SB paper I just referred to. And uh, when you compensate for distance, the FDI magnitude may, may be second to what actually happens after you try to uh, attempt to restore the primary well back to its original production rate. So you were looking at the rates as far as the resulting well performance and then correlating that to that FDI magnitude and the, and the distance as that metric. Yes, the, in the SP paper I referred to, production was reduced by 65% of the original rate. It was so, it was so uh, disheartening that the operator of that, of that well elected to sell off their play, their portion of that play and, and never come back because of the, we were able to restore the well to production with a clean out treatment. But the fact is the Woodford turned out to be extremely sensitive to uh, FDIs. Okay, thanks for that clarification. I wanted to talk about a new term that you introduced in the paper for the first time, and it's called fracture interaction duration severity. I yes, know the paper, I, had the, the paper had the definition. I was wondering if you can comment on what it is and how we should view this during the past, during the, especially for passive well defense. Yes, thank you for that question. FD, FIDS or FIDS was uh, evolved from the realization that FDIs are not all equal. What if you had a 1,000 PSI uh, magnitude FDI that only lasted for five minutes compared to an FDI of the same magnitude that lasted for half an hour? Can I just simply compare FDI magnitudes and, uh, and, get this and say that both are equally damaging? No. The, the, the uh, FDI, the FIDS is measured in PSI hours, simply pressure times time, and uh, not just a single point in space. I realize now that I underdeveloped this term in the paper. I need to figure out a new way of calculating it. I've also concluded that comparing FIDS to just a simple magnitude is not proper. I should compare, I should just, it's a standalone term. And I also need to incorporate integration to get the area under the curve and not just some average pressure times time. That was done because I was just, I was uh, running out of time to get the paper built and I would welcome suggestions from the audience and handle that. But time compensation is necessary to explain the total impact of the, of the FDI on a particular stage. I'm really glad you brought this up because I've actually been trying to come up with a data set for FDI magnitudes, the distance between primary and infill wells, resulting infill well performance, 
But one thing I have not included yet is this duration of severity. So I will be sure to include this parameter in finding that correlation across the board. So I really, I really appreciate you clarifying that. Uh, I want yeah, so go ahead. It's is, is something that uh, it's underdeveloped, and I would uh, appreciate any help you could provide on how we should properly calculate it, and also how we can identify whether uh, a low FIDS is more damaging or less damaging than a regular uh, FDI magnitude. Sure. I mean, the hypothesis would be is that the longer that severity then, or the longer that duration, then the more it impairs the well performance. But there's also other factors that come in. There are also other dimensions for, for FDIs. So as, as well as that mat or the, the total magnitude and the FDI slopes. I wanted to move on to the time synchronization component. And I know when we worked on 194349, we emphasized the importance of the time synchronization. And even in our first paper we did. So just for our viewers and listeners, can you comment on the ease or lack thereof of the time synchronization when detecting FBIs between primary and infill wells and its importance? And then have you had instances where even the slightest offset of time synchronization created a problem? Yes, uh, again, I appreciate the, the question. Synchronization is important when you're trying to establish the start time of the FDI versus uh, the, the uh, treatment well data. If you, don't, if you don't bother with synchronization, then what you have is a yes or no answer. Yes, there was an FDI, and no, I don't know when it started or, uh, you know, in relation to treatment data. One of the things I thought about for the audience is if you don't have synchronization, you've introduced uncertainty into your analysis. What you can do is say that I'm going to assume that the FDI end time is the same as the pumping end time, and then superimpose the two. Uh, pressures on top of each other and align the FDI data until the end of the FDI is the same as the end of pump time and work backwards. So that's, that's all fine and good, but it's a lot of work and I don't feel like not most people have that time to do that. But for those of you out there that don't have synchronized time, that would be my, that would be my guess. With volume to first response, cannot be accurately determined without synchronization. It's just, it just makes the entire analysis more difficult. So thanks for mentioning that because especially when quantifying the volume to first response, as you mentioned, that was really important for our paper for 194349 and for URTEC 3114. So that was our continuation of, of quantifying the technical success of passive well defense. Yes, and uh, Yoshi, let me mention something. When I was there at the symposium, someone told me, well, you don't need F, you know, F uh, volume first response uh, is just a start time. The answer to that is no, it's not. You could load your well a little slower. You could, after the ball ends or, or you start breaking down the new perps, you could, you could pause a little, you could do that slower or faster. And so you're trying to compare start times and that, that may or may not be a, an accurate representation of that. But volume on the other hand, that's fixed. You can measure volume. And I would rather measure volume the first response than just using time, which may or may not be uh, comparable to the previous or later stages. Okay. Well, I, no, I, I agree with you on that because as you mentioned, the volume is fixed and time really does depend on that rate that you pump. So depending on how much you've pumped, you can, you can determine when you can determine that response for, for that FDI or yes. for when observing that FDI. 
Okay. Yeah, in 201 600, I refer to volume of the first response often. I also plot start times for those that don't care about volume to first response. I also have uh, start times, which are which is synchronized data to the treatment data. So whichever form you like, you can get both in that paper. Awesome. Well, when I've been doing some of the FDI analysis, and when I had some discussions internally in my teams, we do a lot, we have a lot of debates in terms of FDI magnitudes and slopes in quantifying a success when it comes to primary infill well or mitigation. I wanted to know from you, since you're the expert, on what are some of the guidelines on how much FDI magnitude is too high and what slope intensity we should be worried about? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. It, it's difficult to quantify it, but here's what, here's, what I, here's what we can all do. And this really applies to asymmetry as well. If we see a slope intensity in one of our frack wings that's double or, uh, or more what it is in the opposing wing, then we can say that we've got an eight, that we've got more fluid going into that wing than we have going into the opposite wing. What we all want is for each wing to have equal distribution of fluid and sand. If you don't have uh, a, a well on the other side to where you have you can watch by wings, what you can do is say, okay, my average uh, slope intensity has been ten. Yes, high per minute, just for example. And now I've got a stage where it's uh, 50, 40 or 50 PSI per minute. That is, an, that is an immediate red flag. You're sending all of your fluid and profit into one wing. Wherever it's going, it's going there in a hurry. And you're not getting a, a, an equal distribution of fluid and sand. What I would do at something like that is I'd either uh, re reduce my rate after I pump a sweep and have a clean well bore. Or you could consider dropping a diverter and trying to get a dominant fracture that's going all in one direction to interrupt it enough to re-divert profit and fluid in, into the other side. And these are easy to spot. You look at 201600, the, the runaway magnitudes stick out like a sore thumb. You can see them really, really fast. Sounds good. I'm really glad that you you mentioned just the relative nature of how much is too high and the slope intensity and in, in identifying those runaway fracks. Speaking of that, there was a plot in the paper where you talked about, or you had a conclusion that the treatment well one, the first treatment well, that frac the fracture wings were growing towards the bounded well, like the first bounded well, and that was the strongest. And I was, I've been reading, I've been looking at that plot and I was just trying to wonder how were you able to tell on the plots where the, where fracture wings were growing, the, where, how fracture wings were growing and how those were the strongest. Yes. Uh... A couple, there's uh, several indications. I always, I never rely on just one plot. One of the things is I saw the volume to first response in treatment well A was, was lower than it was in treatment well B. And then I noticed that the FDI magnitudes and slope intensities in well A were greater than well B. The unique thing about well B, and I temper my remarks with this, well B was being impacted by two treatment wells. It would first see FDIs from treatment well one, and then it would see FDIs from treatment well two. What that told me is that the well, the treatment well B or observation from well B was being pressured up by two treatment wells. And therefore that may have suppressed some FDI magnitudes. And I really suspect it did. But because treatment well A was consistently at higher FDIs. Sometimes the, 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 the uh, FDI magnitudes in, well, in, in observation well B were zero. 
or nearly zero. The, that fluid in sand is going somewhere. And if it's not impacting well B, then it must all, then it must be going to well A. As the treatment progressed, I noticed that as well B pressured up, the distribution and the magnitudes between well A and well B got similar, which was telling me that I had some, I had enough pressure in well B to start uh, the two wells to share uh, fluid and profit more equally. And then in the, by the end of the treatment, if you'll notice, well B started having the highest magnitudes and well A not so much, which told me I've gone from a, from a, a well that's where the fluid and sand is going to the northeast, and then it starts to go to the southwest as the pressure distribution in the reservoir and maybe depletion differences started to cause reorientation of asymmetry. Uh, it, 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 those two wells are, are fascinating. But if you look at the FDI magnitude plot on well A and well B in each of those well pairs, you'll see that the, in general, the well A has consistently the highest magnitudes. And it looks like from that, that this northern direction is preferred. Well B, if you look at that, the, the fracks tend to move south, southeast. If you look at wells C and D, and then you look at wells E and F, you know, what, what you're starting to see is these, is that the preferred direction from treatment well two is towards the southwest. And that's, that stands out a lot. Uh, you can see that these well, that there's first and second order well magnitudes and not so much the magnitude and well B. So again, it, if you study it long enough, you can get an idea of where are my wings growing and why are they growing that way? There, have to, there has to be depletion differences to resolve this and you can. And what the operators out there that are listening, if you see this uh, big discrepancy in wing development, why don't you do something about it? Why don't you, why don't you see, okay, I've got, I've got all of this, this development growth growing you know, asymmetrically in a, in a direction I don't want it to go and start thinking of ways that you can mitigate these uncontrolled wing growths. Thanks for that advice too, because especially with the real time changes, I think there's some there's reluctance on there's reluctance on those real time changes when you see that uncontrollable wing growth and and what to do. And I think there's always been a question on what to do in order to mitigate that. But I and there's there is something to be said about those real-time changes in, in completion designs when we do observe that uncontrollable wing growth between a primary and an infill well. I wanted you you I wanted to talk about not just that specific one, but just the just that structure of the paper and how you show multiple well pairs and and of FDI magnitudes between primary and infills. And I know this was on a pad by pad basis, but I wanted your thoughts on if there's a huge development program across a, a large, like a large acreage and this analysis needs to be scaled. So what are your thoughts on how to easily scale this analysis to multiple pads and even multiple benches at a time so we can see a multi-stack primary infill wells. So how do we make this even easier to tell the story for a full mile wide or two mile wide development? Yes, I, I looked at that and basically my, my paper regards stage by stage. And I, and I was e able to easily assign, you know, a treatment well with its closest offsetting well so I could see wing growth. For a large project like you're discussing, the answer is you're going to have we're going to have to have uh, monitor enough monitored wells, offsetting wells that we can see uh, at the same time on the same screen, which is now possible, yeah, along with the treatment wells, and and look and see where what 
what is happening between all these pads if they're close enough mm -hmm. to interact with each other. And uh, I've never attempted to uh, monitor such a project, but you're right. And I think the, one of the keys is being able to see more data from the offsetting wells at the same time you're pumping fracks so that you can easily see, okay, which wells don't matter in this pad and which wells are, are the ones I need to key in on. And that's doable right now. We can do that. Well, that's really, that's re reassuring because I've seen developments getting bigger and bigger depending on, just depending on which operator you talk to, but there's always a vision of growing your developments and FDI mitigation can be so granular between a specific pad, but if we if we scale this to a larger to a larger development, how we can apply how we can apply that and like the the analysis that you've written in the paper. So that's always that's something that I, I definitely wanted to to hear from you. Well, I know I've peppered you with a lot of questions so far, I and mean, there was one more question I wanted to ask you before. I let you go. And that is, I, from your perspective, what are some of the applications of this analysis that we've never seen before in this industry? Yes, that, and the reason I wrote this paper to start with was to give operators a tool to spot asymmetric growth and give them a chance to intervene as they want to. There was there was uh, there were some of the plots that I was that I considered but did not put in the paper was using the pressure differentials between wings to uh, calculate a percentage of the sand and water that went into each wing that I that I did not did not do. There's also been some controversy as to whether or not the start times uh, in some of these events reach existing fractures or do they reach the existing well bores? If, Cal, if Kyle Hosvite is listening, I believe we can, we can do that. He's got sealed well bore measurements. Wells that do not have any existing fractures, but, he can but his uh, work would establish contact time between a treatment well and a sealed well bore. We could compare those stair times in, in wells like in the existing wells. And what we would expect is the sealed well bore time, depending on distance. Those events would happen later than these 20 or 30 minute times that we see in, in wells that are already existing where we think we've contacted uh, existing fractures. It would be a very interesting study if we could get some data on that. But the, the goal of this work is to help operators optimize their fracture stimulation treatments so that they don't waste money pushing sand and fluid off into the, off into the, the far reaches of the universe that have no, that do not contribute anything back to the existing well and may, have, may in fact uh, degrade the production from the offsetting wells. Awesome. Well, Mike, it was a pleasure having you on this podcast and let and thank you for letting me pepper you with questions regarding 201600. Well, everyone, mm -hmm. you heard it from Mike. Please be sure to check out the paper as well as the paper citations that we've mentioned in the paper or in this podcast, specifically 194349 and 187912. I'll put those paper citations in the description of the podcast and for the YouTube video. Mike, did you have any other last words to say? No, I deeply appreciate the invitation to do this. And for all the other uh, members out there that listen to the podcast, I'm deeply appreciated. Thank you so very much. Awesome. Well, everyone, I am Yoshi Pradhan, and I am signing off. <laughs>